Uh, so my work is focused on looking at how organisations engage with prospective talent in the market, what our candidate experience looks like during recruitment, and then enhancing employee engagement into the future. Uh, so our platform stream is looking really exciting this afternoon. Um, I do want to encourage you to uh, feel free to join the chat and, and uh, um, add your comments and also make sure that you uh, uh, jump in and, and add your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, I will endeavour to ensure that we answer all of those questions at the end of each presentation. So our first speaker in this session is Nuan Dias. Uh, Nuan is joining us from Sri Lanka this afternoon. He specialises in product management for enterprise software, working across IT engineering, marketing, sales and solution architecture. He is particularly passionate about IT strategy, APIs, integration and security, and has spoken at numerous global conferences. Uh, Nuan has worked with WSO2 for over 10 years and last year became their Vice President of API Management and Integration. He'll be presenting on leveraging async APIs to deliver cross-domain agile collaboration. Welcome, Nuan. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you can um, hear me loud and clear and, and see me as well and see the screen as well. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, my name is uh, Nuan Dias. Um, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, I work as the Vice President and Deputy CTO for the API Management and Integration Space at WSO2. So I'm also the co-author of this book called Microservices Security in Action. And my main responsibility is light, lies on the product management side of products that we're building at WSO2. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, how we can leverage asynchronous APIs across organizations to build uh, to build systems, to build the modern APIs and so on. We are going to be going through a few sections where I start off by introducing synchronous versus asynchronous APIs. Then I'll talk a little bit about its the async usages of async APIs and, and its applications. We'll talk a little bit about the specification, like, uh, and then we'll spend more time discussing about the challenges uh, and issues organizations, uh, organizations have to deal with when using asynchronous APIs and how we can solve them as well. So let's get started. So I'd like to start off by uh, talking about synchronous communication uh, because this is an area that all of us understand and we all know. So synchronous communication in very simple terms is basically getting things done on demand. So you go into a coffee shop, you ask for a coffee and you wait till it's delivered and then you take it and then you uh, walk away and enjoy it. Right, so, so when it comes to technical terms, synchronous communications in, in modern APIs that we deal with today are implemented in the form of REST APIs. So this is a pretty straightforward and simple pattern. You have a client and a server, a client make, makes a request to a server, wait till it responds and then gets the data uh, of um, what the server sends and goes, at, goes back and does what it is supposed to do uh, with that data. So this is very simple and straightforward. I'm sure we all, uh, have dealt with REST APIs at some point in our careers. So REST APIs, as I mentioned before, are great for getting things done on demand. What this means is basically you press a button on a, button on a certain application, maybe your mobile device, a web application, uh, anything, and uh, that initiates a request and it gets something done on the server side and returns back either with some data, either with an acknowledgement or something like that. So REST APIs or synchronous communications are great for getting things done on demand. However, in today's world, we also have many situations where we have to react to events as they happen, right? We have to basically, uh, instead of getting things done on demand, we have to react as soon as something happens on some system. It could be our own internal system. It could be since system outside our business domain as well. Um, so. So people used to solve this problem or implement this using polling mechanisms. Um, so what we, in this world, how it happened was that the, you still had the client and the server. So people kind of tried to work around uh, synchronous communications to achieve this, uh, to react to events. And how it happened was by saying, a client saying, um, a client asking the server for updates very frequently. So the client would say, uh, do, I have an, do you have an update for me? Do you have an update for me? And the server would respond, most of the time saying no, and sometimes saying yes. So the problem with this pattern was um, uh, it, it was very expensive, right? So as you can imagine in this scenario, the faster the client wants to know when an event happens, 
the more frequently it keeps to it it has to keep polling the server so research has shown that that the server that 95 percent of the time server response saying there's no no update for you um so what that means is we are wasting a lot of resources like the client has to keep continuous polling and the server as a result of that polling has to uh, re respond as well either with a yes or a no so this didn't really work out and it was uh, pretty expensive and uh, so another alternative to this came in the form of asynchronous communication so again i'm sure all of you are familiar with this pattern how this works is by a client subscribing um to to a publisher right of some sort and what it uh, the, the client gives this is implemented based on the pattern of callbacks so the client says mr server um here's here's my address when something happens on your side can you please call me back on this address and let me know it's it's uh, in simple terms that's what it means right so whenever the server uh, receives such a request the server stores or, or the, we call this a publisher uh, in this case the publisher stores the address of the client and whenever an event happens on the server side the client the server responds uh, to that address with that with the details of the event so this is in very simple terms how uh, asynchronous apis work and this enables us to collaborate with any uh, many different systems that produce events both within and outside our business domain right so this is usually when it comes to the implementation or technical details this is usually implemented by using a broker pack pattern so um, this decouples the publisher and the subscriber right so one important aspect to understand here is that now there is no client server um, pattern here both are clients both the subscriber and the publisher are clients uh, of the broker whenever the publisher has a new event what it does is it notifies the broker and clients the subscribers who are subscribed on the broker then uh, distrib uh, gets this message uh, through the broker so the broker takes the responsibility of redistributing the messages um, to anyone who's subscribed on those respective channels so um, this is how it is usually implemented out there in the world there are many examples you'll find out there one one common example is web sub for http based communications so this this pattern enables us to decouple the publisher and the subscriber so the publisher can now keep focusing on its business domain um, and not worry about the complexities of message distribution and so on right so <clears throat> although this may look simple this broker pattern has its own complexities like when dealing with what if the address of the subscriber is not working what if the subscriber uh, is down what if a new subscriber joins in do i have to distribute all the old messages to it as well or do i have to distribute messages that are coming in now and all of those these nuances so this pattern basically helps us to uh, decouple these two responsibilities in a clean fashion uh, so that we have separation of concerns neatly um, so moving forward uh, we in our day-to-day -day lives use asynchronous apis a lot so i'm sure all of you receive some kind of push notifications on your phone on your web browsers this is these are one example of uh, the types of asynchronous apis in use right these asynchronous apis are very commonly and heavily used in business automation tasks so you may be using lots of systems outside your business domain like salesforce for example calendar google calendar for example right and many different systems like this service now jira whatever right so uh, asynchronous apis are very commonly used for business automation tasks for example if you want to whenever you close off a deal on salesforce if you want to go and consolidate that customer's information in different systems like uh, um, uh, service now for example or something like that right you can use asynchronous apis for uh, consolidating these kinds of systems so the if, if you have heard of systems like if zapier tree these are primarily systems that are focused on doing these kinds of business automation tasks they allow you to simply connect different business systems together and get business automation tasks done easily these kind of asynchronous apis are also very commonly used in engineering process automation so i'm sure all of you are using github in some form so github 
uh, for example, can be used for CI/CD pipelines using Git actions and so on. So what that uh, means is when something happens on GitHub, when a piece of code is committed, you trigger some engineering pipelines upstream so that get, you get your code from development to production or whatever uh, that life cycle is. So these kinds of asynchronous APIs. So the, so the reason these work is primarily because of this eventing and notification mechanism. Right, so they are commonly used in those kinds of use cases as well. Uh, and as you all may be familiar with, microservices architecture is a very common pattern of um, implementation de uh, these days for enterprise architecture. And microservices architecture relies a lot on event-driven communication patterns. So asynchronous APIs are used very commonly uh, in building these kinds of systems as well. So there are lots of similar usages that we uh, encounter in our day-to-day -day lives for various purposes and asynchronous APIs are basically powering all of those integrations between different systems. So I've listed a bunch of technologies that are commonly used to implement asynchronous APIs. There are a bunch of HTTP-based asynchronous API uh, protocols such as WebSockets, WebHooks, WebSub, uh, server-sent events, GraphQL subscriptions and so on. So uh, HTTP based ones are generally used, uh, generally good for client server communications, except for web books and, and so on, right? So, um, and each has its, has its own different characteristics. So WebSockets are commonly used for updating web pages in real time, for example, when something happens on the server side. Uh, web, web hooks are generally used for server to server communication. Uh, when something happens on one system, you notify another system uh, that, is, that is interested in it to trigger some kind of an automation process, right? So similarly, there are lots of protocols and each have their own characteristics. Uh, there are non-HTTP based ones as well, as you can see, Kafka, MQTT based, GRPC and so on. So each, each has their own um, use cases uh, based, on, uh, based on the type of application that is being developed or based on the type of integration that is supposed to be done. And uh, there is a specification for asynchronous APIs now. You all may be familiar with this. This was introduced uh, or launched a couple of years ago, heavily influenced by the open API specification for the for, for REST APIs, for describing RESTful APIs, right? So one important aspect uh, to understand in the async API specification is that uh, the spec, uh, any spec that you find out there in, uh, in the form of async API is um, written from a client perspective so the client can, the, the, both the publisher and the subscriber can be a client, right? So um, when looking at the async API specification, you look at it from that particular viewpoint, right? So how you look at a specification can differ based on whether you are a subscriber or whether you are a publisher. For example, uh, in this particular case, you see uh, there's a, there's a uh, API call or application called my application described here. Uh, and there's a section called servers, which says mybroker.com3514 and says there's a, um, a channel called my channel to which events are published on. So if you look at this particular example, it is written in the form, it is written uh, for a subscriber. So what this says is, if you want to interact with me, what you need to do is to publish a message to the broker sitting on mybroker.com3514 port number 3514. So if, if you are a publisher, the way you, you would look at the specification is slightly different. Um, and uh, you can basically go through the details once reading through the specification. So we'll not spend a lot of time uh, going through the spec, but this is just to let you know that there's a spec for describing different kinds of asynchronous APIs out there. Now, <clears throat> When, when using asynchronous APIs, organizations face many different kinds of challenges. And we are here to talk about most of these uh, today and to look at how we can get through these challenges. So I see them as twofold. There are a certain set of challenges that are faced by consumers of asynchronous APIs as well as producers of um, asynchronous APIs. So there's a difference between a publisher and a producer. We'll, we'll uh, talk about that as we go along. So I've listed these down here. Uh, we'll go through them one by one during the rest of the session. The first challenge that organizations face is finding all these um, events that are being used in an enterprise, in an organization. So if you are a business, 
I'm sure you use different kinds of systems for running business operations and even for implementing your business services. So these could be external systems like GitHub, for example, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Slack, Google Chat, whatever. Right. So all of these things are outside your business domain. So you to implement various kinds of could be automation tasks, could be business operations or anything like this. Developers need to discover a single place of discovery to know um, uh, what systems the uh, business is using. Right. And this could include not just external event sources, but also internal event sources as well. Systems that are running internally in your organization could also be publishing events. So what what you need as an organization or, or one of the challenges that organizations face is, you know, in discovering all of these things. And the solution for that is very simple. What you need to do is to find uh, a developer portal that is capable of listing and describing asynchronous APIs uh, that are being used in your organization. So that's also the problem of discovery where subscribers or developers interested in finding these things they come to this portal they can search through um, all the event sources and consume them in their applications talking about consumption uh, uh, another general problem that everybody faces is uh, is the challenge of subscribing now when we're talking about different different systems one of the main challenges that we have to face today is that these different systems have their own subscription mechanisms for example if you're uh, trying to listen for an event on Salesforce, the way you subscribe to Salesforce is uh, Salesforce events is different than how you would subscribe to, let's say, webhook, subscribe, subscribe to a webhook from GitHub, for example. And it's again different how you would subscribe to an event received from Google Calendar. So one of the challenges that developers have to face is that when um, using these different kinds of systems, they don't have a unified subscription experience. So each application they build need to go through uh, different kinds of subscription experiences and it becomes a tedious task when you are connecting uh, more than a few systems together. Right. So the way to solve this is by bringing in a hub architecture where producers like your internal IT team or whoever is managing these external systems or, or dealing with these external systems they can come in and subscribe all of these external systems on a central hub and a developer portal, as we described in the previous section, right? So, and what, what subscribers now have to do is they now have to come and subscribe at the hub, right? So when subscribing at the hub, you can give a unified subscription experience to all types of clients who want to subscribe uh, to any different kind of producer or publisher. Right. So through that, you can unify the subscription experience. So people who want to implement applications now don't have to go and, uh, you know, figure out how to subscribe to different systems. They get a unified subscription experience. This also helps with security. Right. So, for example, imagine that you want your developers to uh, implement an application that that is listening to events coming in from Salesforce. Now, typically, if you are doing it, uh, today, what you will have to do is you'll have to share the Salesforce credentials or keys with those developers so that they can subscribe their applications uh, with Salesforce. Uh, now, you ideally not want to do that, right? Because it's this, this is sensitive information you're talking about. So uh, what would be ideal is if your internal IT team could do that subscription for them and share it with those developers. And again, this hub architecture helps um, helps you to implement that pattern. So you both get a unified subscription experience as well as a much more secure system as well. Another common issue that uh, developers have to deal with is uh, unsupported protocols. So imagine you want to build a website or a web, web page that needs to be updated frequently with changes that are happening in some kind of a system. So how you typically implement this is by saying is by implementing a WebSocket based system. So your web page would have a WebSocket open and it will basically keep updating the data. But your backend could be implemented on something like, you know, Kafka or a webhook. Right now, how do you deal with this problem? Um, so again, the hub architecture comes into the comes into play and helps you to implement this by doing a protocol transformation. So the hub would receive events from a Kafka topic and then it can push off these events through a WebSocket into the web application that we want to 
keep updated frequently. So again, this can be used, this hub architecture can be used for solving these kinds of problems where the subscriber and producer are basically talking to different languages, right? The next challenge that we have to deal with is um, adherence to contract. So when we are dealing with systems outside, we are basically dealing with systems out of our control, right? So at the initial subscription phase, you subscribe based on a contract saying, uh, Mr. Producer, you are going to send me these events in this format and I'm going to implement my applications to receive events in this format. So all's great. Uh, three months down the line, what happens is uh, this, this producer or publisher could change the format of the event and you may never know, right? So what happens as a result of that, that is that your applications break. They don't know how to, uh, how to read that particular format or the changes that have happened. And this is not a problem that is unique to asynchronous APIs. It is um, there for synchronous APIs as well, but the impact is larger. So for synchronous APIs, as we discussed in the beginning, synchronous APIs are used almost always in an on-demand form. So it happens when a user presses a button, something happens and you get the result. So if something breaks, the user knows at that point. But asynchronous APIs are used for you know, offline automation and things like that. So you're basically waiting for things to happen, right, in, in asynchronous APIs and, and they happen whenever they do. So if something is going wrong, you may assume that you know, things are not happening, right? But by the time you figure out something doesn't look right and you go and investigate, you could have lost a lot of data by that time uh, because the reason being that, that the contract has changed and your systems are no longer operational. So a hub can be used uh, to, to make sure that producers adhere to the contract and whenever events uh, change, the hub can notify the relevant authorities and you know, warn them as soon as something like that happens, right? So another common example in uh, using asynchronous APIs is that sometimes you don't have to know every single event that happens on those systems, right? Imagine you have temperature sensors set up, right? And, and in, a, in a factory, and these temperature sensors emit temperatures say every five minutes, right? You really don't have a need to know the temperature every five minutes, right? Or you have placed a bid, in some place, right? And um, there are other people who are bidding and you really don't need to know every bid, but you only need to know when a bid exceeds a certain limit, right? Or you need to know the temperature when the average temperature exceeds a certain um, certain uh, threshold for a given time unit. So to implement this kind of system, what you need to know, uh, so, so basically every event is not useful in this case. So what you need to know need is a system which can listen to every uh, event, do some processing on those events, and only notify you when those rules or thresholds are made. So you need some kind of processing, some kind of data aggregation, and some kind of logic to make sure uh, that those rules can be implemented. And again, the hub architecture comes into the res rescue to implement uh, such, such use cases. Also, uh, chattiness becomes a problem. So there are certain cases where you don't want um, to receive all the events. You may not need any processing, but you might still need to say, I don't, I'm not really not interested in all the events. Just send me one event per hour and that is, uh, that is enough for me, right? So this, is, this can be useful for subscribers to reduce the rate of events that they are receiving. Um, and the hub can basically do things like rate limiting in order to make sure that you get only the events that you want at the rate that you want. And if you're a producer of events, and are interested in monetizing your events, this also becomes helpful as well, because now what you can do is you can enable rate limiting. You can basically monetize your APIs based on different rate limits plans, saying if you want events every five minutes, you got to pay me $50 an hour. But if you want to receive events every one hour, it's, it's just $5 an hour, something like that. Right. So and, and the hub can basically take care of uh, making sure that uh, the relevant subscribers get the events at the relevant rates only. Uh, finally, monitoring and alerting is also an important aspect when it comes to uh, not just asynchronous APIs, but also synchronous APIs as well. This is basically what gives organizations insights into what's going on with asynchronous APIs. So this really helps organization uh, to realize the value of all of these systems that they are using. Right there, so they can give various insights into how frequently 
you are receiving events from these systems, right? Um, what kind of an impact it has on your business, right? Is it worth what you're paying for them or using these systems, right? So you can make all kinds of decisions if you have a proper monitoring and alerting system in place, right? So an alerting is useful for identifying things like abnormalities, like as we were talking about previously, if, if events are not coming, something could be wrong. Maybe there's a protocol violation, something going on in the system, right? So all these kinds of monitoring and alerting comes in very handy uh, when it comes to not just asynchronous, but as uh, but synchronous systems as well. Uh, when it comes to asynchronous, because there are different types and formats of asynchronous APIs, uh, the dimensions of which you have to be looking at are different. Like, for example, if you're dealing with WebSockets, you need to know how much bandwidth is, is being you know transferred if it's webhooks you need to know how many people are subscribed and so on right so uh, there are different dimensions to be looking at when uh, dealing with uh, asynchronous apis as well so that was what i wanted to cover today very briefly on uh, the different usages of asynchronous apis i'd like to thank you all for joining this session and uh, if there are any questions i'd be happy to take them as well and you can reach me on um, at Nuandias. This is my Twitter handle and LinkedIn handle. So I'd love to get in touch and uh, see if we can collaborate on something. Thanks so much, Nuan. Um, yes, we do have some questions coming through for you. Uh, the first one, I, I'm not sure who it's come from, but um, it's asking why uh, why the, the pub sub MQTT concept is considered to be part of the API. Because it has to, there's a there's a contract, right? So uh, this is uh, all of these things are talking about connecting two different entities, uh, receiver or what we known as a subscriber and uh, a producer. So when you're talking about communicating uh, between uh, two parties, there always has to be a contract. So what happens if the contract changes is that either party could break. So that is why it's important to uh, look at these. Um, systems like be it MQTT, Kafka, or, or whatever the, the, the protocol you may be using, it's important to look at them in the form of an API. Uh, that enables a lot of possibilities for future, not just for you know adherence of contract, but also for future expansions, for others to be able to integrate to it, and so on. So when you have a standard that enables a lot of um, extensions uh, and, and lots of other possibilities as well. Okay, thanks, Nuan. And also, what, what do you see as the main differences between Open API and the Async API uh, specifications? Yeah, so Open APIs are basically describing resources of um, a RESTful interface. And um, so, no matter whether you are a consumer of an Open API or whether you are a uh, producer of an Open API, you would get you would look at the Open API from the same uh, lens, right? So, so you, the, the areas you'd look at um, on it are exactly the same. But when it comes to asynchronous APIs, uh, as I mentioned during my session, uh, this is not a client-server thing. So there are two clients uh, communicating through a common broker. So based on who you are, the areas of interest that you look at on the specification are different. So if you are a subscriber, you would be interested in, um, you know, what channels messages are being published on. Right? And if you are a producer, you'd be interested in what channels um, the, the subscribers are basically listening on and what are the event formats and so on. So those, I think, are, are some of the key differences in these two uh, specifications. Fantastic. All right. Well, that is all the questions that I have through from the audience this afternoon. Nuan, thank right. you so much for your time. It's been a, a pleasure to meet with you. And uh, please, people, do do uh, jump in and, and uh, reach out to Nuan with any further questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Rebecca. Bye.